355, number 355, what a friend we have in Jesus, number 355, let's all stand as we sing this morning, number 355. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grace to Please be seated. Come on up here, boys and girls. Yes, we are going to sing this morning. It's a very, uh, uh, very action-oriented song. It's entitled Heads and Shoulders. So you got to point to your head, shoulders, knees, and if you can reach them, your toes. I'm in a sitting position, which helps me considerably reaching my toes. So head and shoulders, knees and toes. Everybody ready for that? Excellent job. You can touch your toes. Man, we have all these well-trained, calisthenic-oriented individuals up here. Here we go. Head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, knees and toes. Head and shoulders, knees and toes. Clap your hands and praise him. All right. Ready to do it again? Here we go. Head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, knees and toes. Head and shoulders, knees and toes. Clap your hands and praise him. You want to sing it one more time? Yes? Faster? You can do this faster? Okay. Here we go. You ready? Deep breath. Head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, knees and toes. Head and shoulders, knees and toes. Clap your hands and praise him. Excellent job. Wonderful. Good job. Nobody got hurt. That excellent. Thank you. Barely touch your knees. Yes, I can barely touch my knees, too. All right. Good job. See you later, boys and girls. All right. Did you all try that while we were singing? A lot of calisthenics going on. Sitting down. All right. I've got a brand new outline. We uh, finished last week on our series on the doctrine of man. And so this week we are filling in the gap. Uh, actually, uh, Brother... Brother Dennis had asked a question the other day, uh, a couple weeks ago in our class, and I thought, hey, let's just deal with that in one of our lessons coming up. And since we just finished the Doctrine of Man, we're going to, I've got a question. We invented a new series called I've Got a Question. We need uh, like a musical interlude or something like that to introduce our question here. I do, um, and I mention this all the time, and I'll mention it again this morning. Um, I get phone calls, text messages and stuff uh, from a lot of folks that have been at our ministry in the past and are, have moved on, a lot of military guys. Um, there's three or four different folks that contact me on a regular basis and just ask questions. And then f many folks from here in our ministry, I'll get questions, uh, text message to me and, or sometimes emails. And I don't mind that one bit. I enjoy it. Uh, even get some of my grandkids that send me questions which I, as a pup-up, love a bunch and deal with uh, some of the uh, great uh, deep theological questions that are out there. And so, um, 
so if, you know, when Brother Dennis asked this question in Sunday school the other day, which was, and what was interesting, we're talking about the, the age of accountability. What was interesting is that following week, I get, a, I get a phone call from Brother DJ Ray, and of course, Brother DJ was a member here, uh, military, uh, separated from military, living back in, uh, Il- let me see, is he in Indiana? Illinois. He's in Illinois. And um, his mom was in town, uh, Indiana. Thank, thank. I, I know, I always mess that up, and he always corrected me. So thank you on Brother DJ Ray's behalf. Thank you. Um, so his mom was back in, his mom was in town. They, they live in Kansas City area. Uh, currently, and uh, sh- she was asking him the question because they, they had a Bible study at their church, and some of the questions kind of arose. And, and she was asking DJ, and DJ said, "Well, let's just let's, let's just call Pastor Shorter, you know, because that that that's what you do." Uh, and so he called me, and he says, "Hey, you got a few minutes?" I said, "Sure," you know. And so was, we started having the conversation, and so it was about the same subject matter. And of course, and, it, and of course, you know, once you start talking about that subject matter, it kind of evolves into different things. So uh, we had a, just a wonderful time. His mom enjoyed it. I could hear her in the background. And I, I told her, I told Brother DJ, I said, tell, tell your mom to put my, put my number in your speed dial. So anytime you have a deep theological question, you know, call Pastor Shorter. But um, this, is, um, this is one of those subjects that are, uh, uh, weighs heavily on people's minds. You can see in their outline there uh, what is meant by the age of accountability. And I, and I do have a statement there at the beginning. Um, believers have used this term as a means of answering the nagging question of what happens to children uh, who die very young. And so let's, um, let's have a word of prayer first, and then we're going to go to a text of Scripture here in just a second. It, you'll see it. Uh, actually, I don't have the text written in your outline. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And you want to turn there, 2 Samuel chapter 12. And uh, we'll be dealing with a little bit with that section. There's a couple other verses of Scripture we're going to look at this morning. Um, But um, I just want to, it it is one of those subject matters that is often discussed. There's a a lot of different opinions about it. Um, I shouldn't use the word a lot of. There are several different opinions about it, and it kind of runs the full spectrum uh, of... um, uh, of pluses and minuses, but we'll talk a little bit about that this morning. So let's, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, I do thank you, Lord, for the uh, peace that we have and that we find uh, through your word. And Father, this is not an easy subject. It's, it's not one that, uh, that everyone must deal with, but, but many do. And, um, and, I, and I do want to thank you, Lord, that you do not leave us without hope. And I pray, Father, that as we discuss this subject of, a, of age of accountability this morning, you would encourage us um, and help us to understand um, your wonderful grace. Uh, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I want to give you a definition. This is, this is my definition. This is, you're not going to find it in some textbook somewhere, but uh, it pretty, pretty much sums it up. But by definition... When I use the term age of accountability, uh, um, I would define it as this. When a child has reached the age where they can choose right or wrong, they are now accountable to God and need to be saved through faith. Um, I'll say that again. There's not going to be a test later, so you don't have to get it verbatim. But when a child has reached the age where they can choose right or wrong, they are now accountable to God and need to be saved through faith. Uh, that's my definition of age of accountability. And so the primary portion of Scripture that we're looking at this morning is found in 2 Samuel chapter 12. If you've heard about this before, you're very familiar with the, with the setting here. Um, David had sinned with Bathsheba. Bathsheba, of course, uh, was married to Uriah. Uriah is going to be killed in battle. Uh, that was David's plan. Uh, he marries Bathsheba, their child. Of course, she's, she's with child. Um, God is not pleased. Um, Nathan the prophet uh, points David's sin out to him. Thou art the man. It's uh, just a uh, very dark p- part of the history of the life of David, King David. Well, the child is going to die. Um, and this is just, uh, it's a sad uh, um, set here, um, a set of circumstances. David is fasting, he's praying, he's pleading with God. Uh, that this child does not die. We're talking about an infant child. I'm starting in verse number 19. If you're in 2 Samuel chapter, chapter 12, beginning in verse number 19. But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? 
And they said, he is dead. When David, um, excuse me, then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house. And when he required, uh, they set bread before him, he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, what thing is this that thou hast done? That hast thou didst fast and weep for the child when, uh, while uh, it was alive? But when the child was dead, thou didst arise and eat bread. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And that last section there, verse number 23, is the, um, is the key part of, of this concept of, uh, of what is often referred to as age of accountability. Now, I, I want to point out a few things. First of all, David was a saved man. And I believe that when David died, he went into heaven. I have no questions about that at all. The expectation that David expresses here is that his infant child would be where he is going to be at when he goes. When David dies, he expects to see his infant child. And so, um, you know, of course, it, this kind of begs a few questions. The first question it, it begs is, is this, this wishful, is this just wishful thinking on David's behalf or is it inspired by the Spirit of God? That certainly is a question. Another question that, that often uh, is brought up is, is, is what David is talking about. Is he talking about uh, heaven or is he talking about simply the grave? And I, I do want to say, um, and I, I've, I've mentioned this in several sermons I've preached over the years. I talk about this in Bible Institute classes. The Old Testament does not define a lot of things concerning what happens after death like we have in the New Testament. The New Testament paints an extremely vivid picture in not black and white, but in full color of, uh, of the difference between heaven and hell, about, uh, about paradise, things like that. The Old Testament is kind of shadowed. Uh, you'll see a lot of references um, in, uh, made concerning death about going into the grave and, uh, and about, you know, there's, there's no knowledge of God in the grave. And there's a lot of shadow involved in the Old Testament concept of what happens after death. Now, that doesn't change the fact of, of lost and saved. And it doesn't change the fact of hell uh, and heaven. Those, those realities exist but the Old Testament didn't deal with them in a lot of detail. And so David would not have had a lot of detail concerning what happens after we die. And so is this just wishful thinking? Is this just his concept of going, well, I know he's going to be on the other side kind of thing. Okay. So I just I want to put those things out because that's all part of this, this, uh, this argument. Now, the, the point of age of accountability would hold to the fact that David believed that his son would be in heaven and that when he died, when David died, that he would be reunited and join with his son, um, this infant child, in heaven. And so it's the belief that an infant uh, would be in heaven, uh, that infant would be in heaven because, um, because he was not old enough, and, and that's, the, that's the argument, was not old enough to express faith and so that they would, they would instantly... Uh, be ushered into, into paradise. Now, it's, um, let me just say, that that's a, it is a weak argument. It really is. There are some that will run to the, this, the, the one extreme and say, well, listen, salvation is only by grace through faith, and if someone does not express faith, then they are, they are destined for damnation. There's no chance of salvation. So you have an infant child that passes away and there's no expression of faith and so there's no salvation. I do know preachers that hold to that. So they don't believe in an age of accountability. Then we are going to run to the other extreme where folks are going to choose uh, ages 
and, and say, well, listen, God's going to be merciful up to a particular age. Now, he, he, I got a question. <laughs> well, what age would that be? Um, doctrinally, uh, the Roman Catholic Church holds to seven. The Mormon Church holds to the age of eight. There are some Protestant churches that set it at 12. Why would they set it at 12? Anybody know? Exactly, exactly. But there's a biblical, biblical um, point that they make. We see them in the temple, age 12. And so that's, yeah. So they would put the age at 12 because that's when Jesus kind of entered the public world as, you know, I'm, I'm, I know he was just a youngin, but you don't see him, you know, you see him as an infant and then you see him at age 12. That's the next time you see him. And so there's a, there are Protestant churches that hold to the age 12 thing. I was in a preaching service one time. Um, it was in Missouri, and I knew the preacher that was preaching, and he's up there, you know, waxing elegant about something. And he, and he, and he put this out there. He says, he says I've, I've been, it was kind of one of those, I've been really thinking about this, and I kind of wonder if type of thing. And he presented that idea that he didn't, it is possible, and, and he, wasn't, he wasn't dogmatic, but he's, it's kind of like, it is possible that someone cannot get saved until they're at least 12 years old. And I was kind of like taken back by that, thinking, yeah, I don't know about that one, buddy. And I think there was a lot of folks that were a little taken back by that one. But it was, he's an independent Baptist preacher that I'd known for years and years and years and years, preached in this church, as a matter of fact, had good fellowship with him over the years. And I just flat out disagree with him. Um, so, um, you're talking about the Jews, uh, 13 is when bar mitzvah and I guess the bath mitzvah was for the gals. So, um, they would set that, they, they wouldn't use the term, uh, age of accountability, but there is a threshold of age in the Jewish community. And that, that is age 13. Okay. I'm just putting that out there that and all, again, all of that is just conceptual. So you have the, you have the, to have some down this way that say, Unless you're expressing faith, you end up in hell. That would include children, okay? And then you have those over here that are just kind of putting the bar like way out there saying, you know, until you reach this, this age, um, you know, you don't really, you don't have to be born again. Um, there are churches, uh, uh, Presbyterian, there, I don't know if all Presbyterians hold to this. I know Presbyterian Church USA is a lot more liberal uh, than other like Bible Presbyterians and stuff, but there are Presbyterian groups out there that use the term safe. And it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily play into this age of accountability stuff, but they're the, they christen infants in order to make them safe in Christ until they reach an age where they can express faith. You see, they, they add that ingredient in there. And so it kind, of, it kind of blends into that. So this idea of age of accountability, there's, uh, again, there's a lot of different opinions because I'll be honest, this is a weak argument, but I, uh, when I, and I'll express my opinion when we get to the end of this thing. I think most of you know what my opinion is on it. But, um, you know, is there, <laughs> is there an age? And um, I, I want to read a, a verse of Scripture. It's in, um, it's in Isaiah chapter 7. Now this... This verse of scripture is, um, uh, comes right along with that messianic prophecy concerning virgin birth and uh, Isaiah chapter 7. Um, but what I like about this verse of scripture is that it kind of, it, it, it kind of defines a, a little bit of a term here, uh, and it's God defining the term. Um, the um, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 16, it's, it's a part of this uh, messianic prophecy. Uh, verse number 14 is what, of course, we're all familiar with. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. And um, this is all part of a prophecy concerning another child that's going to be born. Uh, but in verse number 16, it says, And before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose the good, uh, and the land that abhorreth shall be forsaken of, by, bo uh, by both her kings. And I, I just, I, this is, of course, a, um, a, a phrase extended by God through the prophet Isaiah defining a particular age of a child, and that is, before a child shall know to refuse evil and choose good. And so I look at that, and, and okay, I'm just, 
again, I'm, I'm building an argument, right, for this idea of age of accountability. If there is an age of accountability, can it be defined by an age, like some people try to do, or is it defined more by an ability? And I would say by an ability, and that is the ability of knowing good and evil, of choosing. And, that, and he, that's, what, that's what that phrase um, it, it's talking about refusing evil and choosing good. So there is, it, it's, it's more than just, it's more than just, you know, somebody, some little kid does something, and you go, oh, that is so cute. They're such good little kids, you know, um, because th th this is purposeful. So God draws a line of purposefulness in reference to good and evil. And so is there, is there a set age on that one? And the answer to that is no, there is no set age. And so if, if, um, if someone is going to hold to a, an age of accountability, it, there really is not a, an age to it. I ran across this definition. This was on a, a Methodist website. Um, um, and this is, this is what this, uh, this particular uh, doctrinal statement had in reference to this. It said, the atonement of Christ, uh, this is their, their statement concerning age of accountability, okay? The atonement of Christ is unconditionally effective in the salvation of those mentally incompetent from birth and children under the age of accountability. Now, they didn't define the age, but uh, their, their statement in reference to, and I, 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 I will say I like the way they put this, the atonement of Christ is unconditionally effective in salvation. And they say, and the... the I mentioned this a couple weeks ago when Brother Dennis was asking the question. The, the first time that I was introduced to the concept had actually nothing to do with children. It had to do with adults that were mentally disabled. And my pastor at the time um, used to take me with him to a lot of different places. He hit, before he ever came to our church, he used to preach in this nursing home facility. And this nursing home facility was not just for older people. It was a, it was a facility for folks that had um, multiple different complications, all right? And some of them were folks that had, were disabled from their, even from their birth and, and mentally incapable. And so they were, you know, basically uh, in, the, in this nursing facility all, most of their entire lives because they had really no capabilities at all. And... Um, he would he would take me there. There was it was a nursing home facility. There was elderly folks there. There were young people that had really um, disabling accidents and things. There were others that were just really bizarre in all kinds of different ways. I, I met a man, and uh, this so you know we're going back forty some years ago, but I met a man who um, um, he would not go through a doorway without spinning around four times. Now, the pastor had warned me about that. So-and-so is going to come to the Bible study, and he's just going to, and he, he would walk up to a doorway, and he, I'm going to get dizzy. He would spin around four times before he would go through a door. He did that every single door that he would go to. And it was just stuck in his head. And no matter what you said to him about that, it was, you know, he didn't care. But I'm just saying, this is, this is a really interesting nursing home facility, okay? The pastor... Um, um, he, um, Brother Bowers, but uh, the pastor had told me, he said, you know, there are folks in here that have, have been, have, have, you know, have severe mental disabilities and through all their life. And he, he's the one who introduced the subject to me. He said he believed that God would be gracious to them because they have no, no ability of ever reasoning out the idea of faith and accepting who Christ is. No, no means at all to be able to do that. And he told me, he said, I, I, do, I do believe that when they die, they would go to heaven. And, you know, I'm a young man, saved just a couple years, scratching my head going, ah, salvation by faith, by grace through faith. And, and so there's, that's, that's how I was introduced to the subject matter. And, of course, you know, from there, then, you, you, then, then you're really running with the ball. Um, so... The, the ability of refusing evil and choosing good is a, is, a, is a line that God draws here in reference to this prophecy, not only concerning Christ, but also another child that's going to be born. Um, and so there's a, there's a line there. I don't know when that line is, um, but God draws the line. 
So now this is, this is where, uh, you know, to me, there's no age. There's no set. There's not like age 12. Um, the Southern Baptist Church for years, I don't know if they still do this, um, but many Southern Baptist churches, they would not have a baptism service until uh, a child. They would not baptize anybody under the age of 12. And it had a lot to do with that perception of, of not being, you know, they don't believe that people can get saved before they're 12 years old. So it had something to do with that. But the problem, the problem that arose, and, and I was never in the Southern Baptist Convention, so I don't, I don't know all the difficulties that came along with that. But it, it was kind of like if you had a group of young people in your church, you had this, you know, when they're all reaching 12, you have this gigantic baptism service, you know, like, I've reached 12. Um, do you, um, did you ever get, get confirmation in the Catholic Church? You get, did you get slapped by the bishop? You didn't get, oh, we had a, we had a good. Have you might have, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But I, re, I re, no, okay. We we had the bishop in Wilmington come down to our parish, and uh, and that's age twelve. Roman Catholic Church, um, you have confirmation. Is that how old we were? Twelve. Uh, 12 yeah. I thought it was more on the brink of high school. Well, that kind of is. I mean, it's almost there. Yeah, twelve years old was the confirmation age in no. in our parish. Yeah. Well, you were much more mature. Yeah, I'm sure. And, <laughs> Never mind. Let me just move on. Um, I haven't grown out of it either. So, the um, but that was age twelve, and 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 what happens is like everybody that's at is in, in that age group is now in there, right? And so the Southern Baptist Church Convention for many years limited baptism for you had to be twelve or older, and so then, then you end up it's kind of like oh you're getting to be twelve, you need to get baptized. Well, what about needing to get saved? And so you have this, this idea of almost a ritualistic type of approach be based on age and not based on what is not based on experience. And so a lot of this all kind of plays into that same scenario about this age of accountability. Now that you're old enough to believe in God, now you can like participate, now you can be involved, and now you can progress in your Christian life as, as, if, as if an age... Is a, is a magical point in a, in a person's life, and it's, and it's not. So one of, the, one of the most important questions that has to be asked in reference to age of accountability is concerning sin. I have that down there. What about sin? And, and so that is certainly needs to be talked about because in order to have salvation, there, there, you, there has to be this dealing with sin. And, and so... I want, to, I want to read a verse of scripture to you, and it's, um, I, I, I got a couple here, but uh, um, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 2, I'm just going to read it. If you like to turn there real quick, I'm, I'm going to be flying out of there real quick, but 1 John 2, 2 says this, and he, talking about Jesus, is the propitiation of our sins, and we would all say amen to that. He's the covering. He covers our sins by his precious blood. The picture is Old Testament. The picture is the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the high priest sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat as a, as a deferment for, for the punishment of sin for the children of Israel. But Christ is our complete removal of our sin. The blood of Christ is sprinkled upon us and our, our, uh, satisfies God's requirements concerning the law. Boom, it's done. Okay? Amen. But it says this. He's the propitiation of our sins, but not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's important. So whose sins did Jesus die for? Any guesses here? It says what it says, doesn't it? So does that mean somebody over somewhere in some country that never heard of Jesus, did Jesus die for their sins? How about an infant child? How about a child that's never been born? Yeah. Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. So my point is this. Are, are there sins paid for by the blood of Christ. 
So this is when we when we start talking about age of accountability, and we talk, start, and, and this is David, right? He is his his infant child dies, and he's like, okay, I you know he can't come back, but I'm going to where he's at. Okay, when I die, I'm going to see him in heaven. Type of mentality. Is he right? Is he wrong? Did that infant child have what? It's like did they go to did they go to heaven with their sins? Now I want to remind you, and, and this is maybe. A, We'll have a whole other discussion about this. Um, but I want to remind you that our condemnation is not based on the number of sins that we've done. Our condemnation is based on the fact that we are sinners. When did you sin? When did you sin? When did you become a sinner? Did you become a sinner the first time you ever sinned? When, Dina, when did you become a sinner? You inherited it. We sinned in Adam. That's what the Bible says. For as by one man, death entered in the world, death by sin, death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. We died in Adam. We sinned in Adam. I misquoted that horribly. Um, the, the reality of it is that our sinful condition is not based on behavior. Our sinful condition is based on our connection with Adam. And, and so that means even an infant child. You say, well, they didn't do anything wrong yet. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't negate the reality of their nature. They're sinners by their nature. That just produces sinful action. And so the big question we talk about age of accountability has to be, our sins being our sins dealt with. Well, the very nature of the death of Christ is, was sufficient to pay for all sin. So that means everybody that's ever been in the world or ever be in the world, their sins have been paid for by Jesus Christ. When they're born, even. Before they're even born. Okay, so, yeah. So then they are born sinless. No. They're born with a sinful nature. Yeah, but, well, yeah. Oh, so that's what we carry with us, the nature. The nature, exactly right. It's the sinful nature. It's, it's an interesting concept because uh, it's the whole idea of God being outside of time. We're thinking linear as in someone's not born. Correct. And God's kind of outside of time. So Correct. So we're thinking a child's not born, therefore he hasn't sinned, and God's above time, so it, yeah. it's not as linear as our, our heads are thinking. Well, in, 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 in a, yes, in a sense, exactly right, Tom, because, because um, the understanding of sinful condition is not based on events. The idea of sinful condition is based on the reality. Uh, it, it, the doctrine is called seminal headship, and it's the idea that uh, through one individual that sin has now passed through everyone that's a descendant of them. And, and that applies to all of us. We are all related to Adam. Somehow, some way, some shape, or some form. We are the sons of Adam, and as uh, C.S. Lewis says in Narnia, and the daughters of Eve, okay? And so we are all the descendants of Adam and Eve, and so because of that, we carry the sinful nature. That's what condemns us. It's our sinful behavior that's a result of our sinful nature, but our sinful nature is what needs to be dealt with. Christ's death on the cross was sufficient to pay for all of our sin. It's a done deal. The problem is, is the application of that payment. And that at the application of that payment is made through faith. You put your faith in Jesus Christ, that the sins are already paid for. It's not like Christ is, going, oh, i got to pay for this guy now, you know. That's not how it works. The application of that, of that payment. So the payment has to be applied when someone believes in Jesus Christ. But here's the, the issue, of course, when we talk about, um, uh, talk about um, an age of accountability, is that, for instance, children, they cannot express faith in Christ. They, they, don't, they have not reached the point where they can, they can refuse evil and choose good. And so there's no means by which they can express faith. And so the, 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 the concept of age of accountability is that God um, does not apply the penalty of their sins, but relies on the payment of Christ for those that have not been able to believe. That's the idea. So, the, so sin is not just overlooked. The, the, um, 
the, the payment of Christ would then be sufficient to, to save them based on their lack of ability of believing. And, and so the sin issue is, in, in reference to that, the sin issue is not really an issue. It, it, can, be, it, can, be, um, it, it can be dealt with in that way. I, 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 we're working our way down here. I got another thing I want to talk about, and you'll see it on there. What the de- what, what's the deal with limbo? All right, anybody ever hear of limbo? I'm not talking about like the limbo, like the dance. I can't do that. What, what's, what's limbo? Anybody know what limbo is? Back and forth. No, no. no. He, he, does he know? He, besides the dance, does do you guys do the limbo? Okay. What's that? Okay. All right, that's fine. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a Roman Catholic Church doctrine, and it's uh, the Roman Catholic Church position. Uh, it's a place where primarily infants go uh, who die without being christened, that's the key part, uh, and still possess, quote unquote, uh, air quotes here, original sin. You, you've heard of limbo growing up, De- Deborah, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm still, still alive, okay? And so, again, after I got saved, I look in the Bible, it's not there, all right? So they use the concept original sin. And so if an infant dies without being christened, now what they believe, Roman Catholic Church believes, is that their christening removes original sin. Now, you will never hear me using the word original sin when I'm preaching, okay? Because that term original sin, just it just like, you know, it's like nails on the chalkboard kind of thing to me. Because there's a lot of baggage that comes along with this idea of original sin. So in Roman Catholic teaching... And I, I, I'm, I'm sure that that carried over into like the Episcopal Church and, and others that are, you know, kind of Catholic light. So it's not just the one denomination. But the idea of original sin carries along the idea that, that, you, that, that everyone's born with a not just sinful nature, but the original sin of Adam. And so that through christening or baptism, as, as some Protestant teachers, t- churches will teach, that that original sin is removed and that we're, we're now, you know, able to be saved. So now I got, I got some problems here <laughs> because now in reference to infants, the Catholic Church believes that if, it, if an infant dies without being christening, so they die with their original sin, they did go to a place called limbo, which is not, is not hell, but it's not heaven because they died with their original sin. Um, so that's, again, you say, well, they made up a term, we made up a term, so everybody's happy. Well, the, the problem with, with their idea is this term original sin. Because in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, after original sin is dealt with through christening, you know, infants are christened, you know, original sin is taken, taken care of. But the idea of original sin tells me that there is now progression of sin. So if... A ritual can remove original sin. What happens when you sin again? So now you have, you know, for for them, they have venial sins and mortal sins. They have different categories of sins. So now you have to go through rituals in order to remove these progressive sins. The concept of original sin brings along with it this doctrine that's rooted in this continual need for the forgiveness of sins in order to gain or maintain salvation. So their whole concept of where infants go revolves around the continual need to remove sin through the sacraments. Now, I I believe, and I want to read this verse. I love this verse in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews Hebrews 10, 12. But, But this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. There is one need for sacrifice. There is one time that a person receives God's forgiveness. Remember, Christ already paid it. And when we we express our faith in Jesus Christ, that payment is applied to us. And when that payment is applied, we're not just talking about or, original sin. We're talking about all sin is forgiven. And so the whole concept of original sin 
just flies right in the face of the full atonement of Jesus Christ. I believe in full atonement. I believe it's, it's done. When Christ died, it was sufficient, paid all the price for sin. And when I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I was totally cleansed and washed. And, and so this whole concept of limbo kind of, kind of screams right in that face. Now, man, I got a half a gazillion things else I want to say, but we're out of time. And so um, keep your piece of paper because I have another question for you. What about that guy in the South Pacific on this little remote island that has never heard even an ounce of the gospel? Well, you'll, we'll answer it next week. Lord bless you. Thank you for being in Sunday school this morning.